Friends, good morning. Grace to you and peace in the name of God, our Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's truly a joy to have you joining us for worship this morning. And as we begin, not long from now, we will be joining in our first hymn, God is Here. I want to highlight one of the verses from that hymn as we start. It is the second verse that reads, Here are symbols to remind us of our lifelong need of grace. Here are table, font, and pulpit. Here the cross has central place. Here in honesty of preaching. Here in silence as in speech. Here in newness and renewal. God the Spirit comes to each. Friends, may we seek God's presence in our worship today, and may we also be reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 11, as he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My prayer is that in our worship today, we may find rest for our souls and that we may be guided by God's Spirit into renewed and transformed lives. Join me now, if you will, as Mike Thomas leads us in today's call to worship. Good morning. Would you join me in the call to worship? In times of trouble and distress, God is always present with us. When we call out, God hears us. The name of the Lord brings comfort to heavy hearts. In God's name alone do we put our trust. The Lord will help those who seek God. God will answer the prayers of the people. Some take pride in their might and accomplishments. We will boast in God alone. We rise and stand on the righteousness of God. Let us worship God, who is faithful, merciful, and just. And now would you join us as we sing the hymn, God is Here.
Our first reading this morning is Mark 1, 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while he was still, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place where there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Good morning. I have a remote with me today, and this remote is used to change TV channels or turn the TV off and on. What gives it the power to do that? If you said batteries, if I can get this top off, you are correct. Batteries are what give this power. Now, what if I took the batteries out and then tried to change the TV channels? Would that work? No because the batteries are the source of power. You may have a remote control car at home and you need batteries for that to run. Or your dad or your grandfather may have power tools and for those to work, they need batteries. We as humans also need a power source. What do you think that would be? Well, we need food, drink, and sleep to help our bodies grow, but we also need another source of power, especially when life gets difficult. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29, Reverend Murphy's going to read, and it says, God is the one who gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Now, the battery right here, that is like God, and God is like a battery deep inside of us, giving us the ability to keep trying after we have failed or to forgive someone after they've hurt us so we can be friends with them again. God is a truly amazing power source. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it says that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint because God is our power source. I want to encourage all of you to always ask God to start your day by asking God to be inside of you so that he will give you the power needed to face any and every challenge. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for living within us and giving us the power that we need to face everything that life has to give us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let us hear the word of the Lord as we turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 21 through 31, where the prophet writes these words. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. 
not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I begin our message this morning, I want to turn the calendar back a few years to a uh, Saturday evening post cartoon that was run uh, again many years ago. And it, the, the cartoon showed a man who was about to be rescued after he'd spent a long time shipwrecked on a tiny deserted island. The sailor that was in charge of the rescue team stepped onto the beach and handed this man a stack of newspapers. Compliments of the captain, the sailor said. He would like you to glance at all the headlines to see if you still would like to be rescued. <laughs> yeah, well, compliments of the captain, right? I lead with that comic in that cartoon because I think we can all relate these days especially. I think most of us would choose a deserted island over the inhabited world that has produced such recent headlines that we've had to deal with. To be honest, I think you would agree that the news from 2020 and so far this much of 2021 seems to be like a month-to-month -month challenge to top last month's bad news with worse news, dominated by things like the coronavirus pandemic, and add to that the protests and unrest over social issues that we saw last summer, a contentious election cycle, wild conspiracy theories, and a host of other potential crises. Remember? Remember the reports about the murder hornet? Yeah, whatever happened to that anyway? And it's no wonder we're all feeling kind of an information overload. I, I think recently I heard a phrase that I, I'm going to hang on to. It was called an information hangover. And I think that's pretty accurate. And all of this happening during a year in which many of us were staying at home because of quarantine and social distancing issues. And naturally, being at home more led us to consume more news than normal anyhow. Again, I think it's fair to speculate that many listening to this message are old enough to remember when news outlets consisted of three major network channels, one public broadcasting channel, the daily newspaper, and radio. And when Walter Cronkite signed off, that's the way it is at the end of every evening news broadcast. We had some time between the next broadcast to digest what was going on in the world. Fast forward that to today's 24-7, multi-platform, social media-driven, constant cycle of news that confronts us today and every day. And friends, this is a cycle that gives us exactly zero time zero time to process, and it seems to pile on the unprocessed information, more information that's not only anxiety producing, but also controversial. Headlines and stories tend to include a lot of conflicting information, leaving us confused, leaving us stressed, often with no tangible way to respond other than to offer our opinion. Neil Postman, Writing in his 1985 book that was entitled Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse, pardon me, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. He called this the loop of impotence, or more precisely, dealing with the fact that, in his words, the news elicits from you a variety of opinions about which you can do nothing except to offer them as more news about which you can do nothing. 
Again, I was quoting from his 1985 book. Yes, you heard that right. And Postman writing in these days before the internet was already pointing to the problem of our news fatigue or a general discomfort, might be more precise to say, that leaves us feeling depressed, leaves us feeling powerless, leaves us, leaves us distrustful of news sources that often seem sensationalist and superficial, inaccurate and, yes, biased, hopelessly biased. The result is that the more news we consume, the more anxiety we experience. And on the flip side, the more desensitized we become to the news itself. One solution to that anxiety is to simply unplug, to turn the news off. But that becomes increasingly difficult in a world where we are bombarded with news every time we go into the public spaces, in person or online. We also need to be informed, but how do we become informed without becoming overstimulated? Another solution might be to only focus on the good news. As people like actor John Krasinski tried to help us do last year through his Some Good News videos. And if you haven't watched these, I recommend them for a smile. Just go to YouTube and type in John Krasinski Some Good News. Guaranteed to make you smile. But neither ignorance nor selectivity would seem to be the answer in a world anxious for the kind of news that people can actually consume in a way that they can then act upon. May I suggest that it would be helpful to cultivate and maintain a mindset that puts the current news within the context of an eternal perspective. The bad and good stuff happening now well, guess what? It's happened before and it will happen again. Remember the book of Ecclesiastes and later groups like the birds and the mamas and the papas reminding us for everything there is a season. Rather than fret or foster yet another opinion about all of this, the prophet Isaiah calls us to remember that the only news that really matters is that the God who created the world in which all this news happens is still the God who is at work and will ultimately set everything right. Isaiah wrote to a people who were confronted with the reality of exile. These were people who were isolated, people who were distanced far from home by the circumstances that they did not choose themselves. Actually, we come to understand that these were Circumstances that were a result of their sinful choices. In the opening verses of the 40th chapter, verses 1 through 11, God announces through the prophet that a return from exile is going to happen. It is on the horizon. A new exodus in which God's people would be set free. God's people would be restored. God himself would dwell with them and he would feed them. He would protect them as a shepherd feeds and protects his flocks. This is the news that God's people needed to hear. And it's the news that puts all other news into a proper perspective. While we worry about news over forces of nature that threaten or overwhelm us, God reminds us that he is the creator who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. That's verse 12 of Isaiah 40. And while the daily news focuses on the intrigue between nations, God reminds his people that to him, the nations are simply like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as dust on the scales. That's verse 15. They are as nothing before him. They are accounted as less than nothing and emptiness. That's verse 17. And while the producers of today's news need to need us, pardon me, to be constantly concerned about our material safety, our wealth, 
God reminds us as he reminds his people to be careful what we worship and to be mindful of the things over which we are fearful, over which we fret. The glory of God and the character of God provides us with the best news we could possibly hear. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Just ask the creator God, the one who sits above the circle of the earth and rules over it. We read in verses 21 and 22. The natural and human caused calamities that dominate the news cycle are not news to God. God puts them all into perspective, that is, by taking the long view. Those rulers and newsmakers who crowd our screens today are as nothing to God, who sees them like withered plants that are here today and gone tomorrow. Again, reflecting on his writings from verses 23 and 24. And no one who makes the news will ever be God's equal. He is the one who creates all things, verses 25 and 26. And so for us, these words from the prophet are powerful, powerful reminders for the people of God who, like Israel, often get caught up in the news of the day. And when we get caught up, we begin to despair or worse, begin to get sucked into the world's idolatry, into the world's fears, into the world's intrigue. And this News fatigue that results makes us believe, like Israel believed, that our plight, like their plight, is hidden from the Lord and that they have been disregarded by God. But that's when God comes shouting through once again, shouting through with news that should dominate the attention of all God's people in every age, regardless of their circumstances. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Notice the repeat here is a repeat of verse 12, which is a way of bringing home the point that God who had created the ends of the earth allows nothing to escape his notice and will allow nothing to defeat his purposes for his creation, his good creation. No matter how bad the news seems to be, God and God's purposes will be victorious. God and God's purposes will win out. And that's the reason God does not suffer from news fatigue, pardon me, news fatigue. As Isaiah puts it, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. That's verse 28 and verse 29. Not only does God know the long view of his purpose in history, he offers his power, he offers his strength to those who feel the fatigue of bad news in the present. As human beings, we tend to busy ourselves trying to either come up with solutions to every problem or offering opinions to those who should be doing something to fix these problems. But as the pandemic has taught us all in a humbling lesson, there are limits to human knowledge and human ability. If we trust only in ourselves, we are bound to experience the fatigue of despair when we fail to reach the end of our rope and the end of our ability. You see, the energy and idealism of youth can lead to disappointment and exhaustion when reality sets in and we cannot fix the news, no matter how hard we try. Rather than fret or fear the news or fixate on the news or even forego the news, Isaiah invites us. Isaiah invites us to deal with our fatigue in light of the larger reality 
that the Creator God has declared to be true. God is in charge. Instead of waiting on the news by constantly refreshing our screens or scrolling through our social media feed, Isaiah instead invites us to wait for the Lord. That doesn't mean simply that we just sit around and do nothing, allowing the news to continue to wash over us in its vicious cycles. But to wait on the Lord means to look to God to provide us with perspective, to look to God to provide us with hope and purpose. And we achieve this through prayer, through being immersed in God's word, through being disciplined in our Christian practice to hear and heed God's voice. How much might our news fatigue be mitigated, for example, if we committed to spending at least as much time in prayer as we do to scrolling through the news and social media. Is that a challenge you'd be willing to try? It would be a challenge for me, I have to admit. You see, many of our phones and devices now tell us precisely how much time we spend on every activity we do throughout the day. What if study and prayer were part of our screen time report? Spending an equivalent amount of time, or perhaps even more, listening to God and bringing our fatigue and our worries to God would allow us the opportunity to put these things in perspective while renewing our strength to deal with the things we can actually do something about. And then the rest of it? Well, simply put, the rest is in God's hands, knowing that his purposes will win out in the end. Friends, for you and for me, countering the news with a daily discipline of time spent in the presence of God will enable us to pick a different pace for life, a healthier pace for life, a more realistic pace for life. And as we understand how we come to these realities, I want to ask you this question. Do you grab your phone to check the news first thing in the morning? I do. I've, I've been guilty of this myself. And in so doing, I've found that there's a pattern in practice that creates a problem. That's a recipe for me that starts the day with anxiety rather than mounting up for the day with wings as eagles, as Isaiah writes in verse 31. So instead, let's rise to a different challenge. Let's rise to a challenge to resolve the beginning, or to resolve to begin each day with scripture and prayer before we reach down to touch that phone or even pick up the TV remote. Allow God's word to nourish you and to strengthen you for the day ahead. Prepare you to run the gauntlet of the day without growing weary or discouraged and to walk steadily forward without fainting under the load, the heavy load of bad news. So friends, for us, the cure for our news fatigue is to begin with the good news first and to focus on the good news. Stay focused on the good news. Today and always, may God bless us in our journey and in our faithful pursuit of God's gospel. Amen and amen. Indeed, we place our trust in a God who knows us each and every one and hears our prayers. And so may we begin this time of prayer as we turn to God and share our own concerns in this moment of silence. Will you bow your hearts and heads with me? In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And as we bow before you this morning, Almighty God, we must admit that sometimes the difficulties and burdens of our lives cause us to doubt in you and to doubt in your goodness and faithfulness. We confess that we are people who are anxious. 
And often we grasp to trust in your promises to work all things for good. We fail to be confident in your goodness and your faithfulness. And so our prayer is that you would increase our faith, that you would grant us your peace that passes all understanding, and that our lives would demonstrate our trust in you. Lord, we ask this with confidence, knowing that we are your beloved children. We give you thanks for being there even when we cannot sense your presence. And we pray that your faithfulness will grow in us and that we will grow in abiding in your truth and your grace. Lord, in addition to our prayers that we mentioned, prayers of a personal nature with which we began our time today, we add concerns that we share as a church family, an extended church family, as we now lift up the names of Kara and Bam, Kim and Ray, Bethany and Lenny, Janice and Joel, Tandy and Jerry Sue, Sam and Tammy, Kevin and Pat, John and Wendell, Raina and Lacey, Debbie and Joanne, Mary Ellen and Mary Jo, Kless and our own Presbytery of Mid-Kentucky as well as our congregation here at Bethel First Presbyterian Church. Lord, we add prayers for the Higby family and for those serving in our troops. And we close this morning with familiar words that were taught to us by your son as he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
friends, we are glad that you could be with us in our worship today. And now as you go, may the God of all hope open your eyes. May the God of all peace still your anxious mind. May the God of all love fill your heart to fullness beyond measure. Friends, go now in the hope and peace and love of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you today and always. Amen and amen.